Hello again, everyone. This is Doug for the Checking the Gate podcast. Uh, thanks again for tuning in. Just a couple of little things. This is a episode recorded very early on, so we didn't exactly have the title and everything figured out, as you'll hear very soon. And uh, also, the audio quality is also still not amazing. It's just going to take some time. Uh, I think there's just one or two more episodes where that's a problem. So thanks for keeping tuned in. Uh, it won't be long before things just start to reach a level of normalcy. I just, I really didn't want to re-record everything because I've done that before and it's a bloody nuisance. But thanks so much. Uh, hear me at music a to z podcast dot com and the pollinate show dot com and nshgfilms.com. I live to entertain you. So thanks so much for your support. Keep subscribed. Uh, we'll be on iTunes. I'm looking forward to where this podcast is going to go. I think it's going to be great. Thanks so much. to real podcast i'm doug ferguson and i'm mason and the, yeah, this is a day working title for our podcast at the moment as we're as we're recording it i don't have everything set in stone i've come up with a few suggestions like obsolete projector and uh, see-through disc yeah and they're just i don't know there's i think there's a sort of necess- necessity for a catchiness of a title um and yeah, I don't know. Those don't work for me, but we'll see. Uh, I'm. Oh, we could do a voting thing. Get a voting people. thing. Yeah, yeah, but then people. I want then it to be named before I get it out there for people to listen. That, that's why we have a working title, and then we go, "Hey, do you like these better?" And then, and then I have to change the title, and then people have to. I don't know. I, I'd rather have a title than have people listen to it. Oh. Well, you know what does have a title? Uh, a lot of things. Yes, yeah. uh, but most notably the movie we are, uh, we just saw Spider-Man 1, uh, directed by Sam Raimi. Yes, that's, uh, that's true. Uh, so yeah, this is our, our movie for today. Uh, that's Spider-Man. A really good uh, come, transition. Come a little closer to the mic. Oh. The mic is your friend. It wants to hear you. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, that, that was a really, really good tra- uh, transition. I think I'm going to high-five myself with that. Which, coincidentally, is what I think uh, David Coop, the writer of the script, was doing quite a lot. Oh, yeah, there's a guy who um, who just, he really loves his little winks and his nods. <laughs> and, um, and dramatic irony. So much dramatic irony. I, I wanted to dramatically throw up, ironically. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, well. Uh, yeah, so, uh, let's, let's talk about the movie. So, it's, it's Spider-Man, it's based off of the extremely popular comic book series. Oh, so uh, pro- probably one of the most famous, uh, car- not car- car- comic book characters in, in history. Yeah. I think, I mean, there's, when you think of comic book characters, you think of Superman, Batman, and Spider-Man. And the X-Men, and the Incredible Hulk. Well, I mean, I know, but, but I think if you had, th- if you had to pick three... Uh, how, how do you want to do this? Do you want to start off with uh, uh, inconsistencies with uh, the comic book? No, you know, the thing is is that I w- kind of want to judge the movie uh, by its own merits. It's, it's its own entity. And the thing is yeah, you have to realize is that with any adaptation of a movie or, or of a comic book or a novel mm-hmm. or whatever it is, you're not going to have a straight-up adaptation. It's not going to be perfect. And, and I think... I mean, because you, you need to adapt the material, A, to fit two hours, mm-hmm. B, to appeal, to tell a story that can appeal to sort of a mass audience. But, but then again, on uh, the flip side of that coin is when you're adapting uh, something with as much history and story and content to work with, uh, y- you need to know where it's coming from and you also need to know a little bit about where it's coming from. Okay, I mean, well, that's and that's the thing is that while you obviously can take some liberties with the source material, it's a good idea to 
be faithful to it as well. Especially since you're gonna get the you gotta appeal to some level to the fans of the comic book because they're the ones who got Spider Man there in the first place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And is kinda of why everybody cheers when they see Stan Lee, uh, the creator one of the creators of Spider Man. Yeah, well, and, I mean, he's in, he's in almost all the Marvel movies. Oh, well, um, it, I don't it, think he was in Avengers, interestingly enough. Uh, what, wasn't he? No, I don't think so. I can't remember. It's been so long. But I, I, in fact, I think he made a joke about that. We, there was a fan expo in Vancouver recently, and Stanley was there. Oh. And there was a Q&A. Mm-hmm. And one of the things is like, he, he, he joked about was that the Avengers made so much money because people were so used to his cameos. They kept watching it again to see if they could spot it this time around. <laughs> um, he's very clever. Actually, I really like Stanley as far as like, he, like his personality goes. Yeah, he's just he is like a comic book character. Uh, apparently, he's like ancient. He's like ninety. Uh, apparently, uh, his last name is actually like Leibowitz or something. Okay, and uh, he shortened it to Lee uh, when he started writing comic books because he uh, thought uh, he wanted to save his actual name for legitimate literature. <laughs> uh, uh, well, you know that how that ship sailed. <laughs> he just got associated with comic books, and um, and uh, and to be fair, I think that comic books are a legitimate form of literature. Yes, I, yes, I they totally, are. I totally believe that. Like, there's just, I mean, it's it's not as wordy, obviously, as a reading a novel, but you, you but you can get. It's so engrossed in the art, and like every panel is is well, a piece of art in itself. In, in terms of literature, I would say post nineteen eighties com or uh, sorry, nineteen eighties onward comic books is where it started to get like really more like literature and less like uh, camp superheroes. Mm-hmm. Which again ties into Spider Man, the movie that we're reviewing. Yes. Uh, in that, I feel that. It kind of embraced the camp. Uh, a little too much, though. Arguably. Arguably, yes, a little too much. And, and I, I, am, I do have a sort of ambivalent feeling toward their approach on the hero. Because I, I think that... I, I guess I kind of feel like this, the ideal Spider-Man movie still hasn't been made yet. Um, I, I mean, even, even though they've restarted the series and are now taking like the Amazing Spider-Man in a different direction, I still feel like... Like they haven't they haven't hit the nail on the head. They haven't quite made it there. And and I think that's the Sam Raimi series has a lot of good parts and uh, hits a lot of good notes, but they haven't quite they just they just haven't done justice quite for the character yet. Okay, well uh, synopsis then? Yeah, well yeah, let's talk about what the what the movie goes through. Okay, so uh, poor Peter Parker was pitiful. <laughs> he couldn't have been any shyer and Mary Jane uh, wouldn't notice him, even if his hair was on fire. Okay, okay. <laughs> so in case anyone's missing out here and doesn't fully understand, uh, Mason has gotten into the Weird Al song uh, <laughs> about the Spider-Man movie. Uh, <laughs> but, I mean, actually, that song does a really good job of summarizing the movie. It, it really, uh, really does. Uh, so uh, one day that uh, spider uh, came down, Wait, no, no, I'm forgetting. That's okay, then. Well, maybe we'll move on. <laughs> okay, so uh, Peter Parker is uh, a laughable nerd, and he uh, likes Mary Jane uh, Watson, who is the girl next door. Actually, literally the girl next door. Yeah, yeah. Like, not even like the girl next door kind of girl, but, but like is literally... Physically. She, she lives next door to him. Yeah. Uh, one thing I, I really like about uh, this movie is uh, they actually touched on the fact uh, from the comic books that Mary Jane's uh, home life was pretty abusive. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it delved into, into it just the right amount. Because you, you saw what it was, but it didn't, like, it didn't focus on it. And it sort of showed that her character was a little bit, was stronger than that that situation. A little bit, yeah. yeah. Uh, even though she does fall uh, quite literally into the role of damsel in distress. Oh, uh, it's true, actually. Yeah, there's a three separate occasions in a two-hour film in which she needs to be saved by Spider-Man. Yeah. It really makes sense for the last one, but for the first two, it is just kind of bad luck. It's like a yeah. circumstance, you know? It's kind of like, you know, they're 
the writers going, we need something for Spider-Man to do. Yeah. So how much can we make her suffer? Anyway, uh, it also follows uh, Norman Osborn, the uh, CEO and head of Oscorp. Yeah. Which uh, he founded because uh, Oscorp, Osborn. Yeah. They have a project that is uh, underway, uh, which I guess experiments on changing people's genetics to bring out their their superhuman capabilities. Well, let's just say superhero uh, serum because super superhero villain serum. Uh, well, <laughs> super villain. Serum. A super soldier serum. Uh, let, yeah. Let, let's just say that because even though they didn't say it uh, in the comics, that's kind of what it was supposed to be. And uh, was it supposed to be like the super it, it, soldier serum, like Captain America? Captain America, America yeah. Because I okay, well, I as, mean, as far as I understand, like since Captain America, everyone else was trying to do Captain America. Yeah. Especially in uh, the more uh, recent Marvel films, uh, Edward Norton's Incredible Hulk. Uh, it was like, you know, trying to create super soldiers, um, and uh, everything else. In any case, um, the uh, Norman Osborn is about to get his funding pulled. The future of Oscorp is uncertain. And so he's like, well, I guess I just got to ship this thing into human testing because I don't want to lose all the stuff that we've worked toward. And, yeah. he, and he figures, you know who the best person to do testing on is? Me. Me. <laughs> um, so he does. He gives himself the, the – he gets filled with the goblin gas. And he goes all crazy, and he kills some of his co-workers, and, uh, and basically he starts working his own agenda to secure the future of his company. But and is this really an agenda overall? There's, like, with the Green Goblin's whole motivation, there rarely seems to be any. It's, well, it's, it's a kind of a self-preservation thing. It's sort of like, it's like, it's, the Goblin is working in the subconscious of Norman Osborn to do his bidding for his best interests. But, like... Then he takes out the board of directors, so, like, there's no threat of the company getting sold or anything. Yeah. It's back in his power. And then after that, he just kind of snaps and goes, what do we do? Now? Let's kill Spider-Man. That's true, actually. It, his, there's a switch in where he's like, well, I've done all the things that I Need needed to. to. What can I do now? Because I'm still crazy. Uh, yeah, Spider-Man's he's about as strong as I am. I'm gonna kill him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's like just kind of so out of left field. I mean, I mean, well, I think what it is is that he just he, he, Spider-Man was an obstacle he, as the Green Goblin was. Uh, although the Green Goblin still succeeded at killing the board of directors, um, <laughs> Spider-Man was an obstacle, and he's and he saw so he saw a an imbalance in power essentially. But, and he's like, I want to be the most powerful. Yeah, but that. Know. Even that's not true, because he was able to accomplish all of his goals without the only person who could actually challenge him even being aware of what he's trying to do. Yeah. Uh, so, like, theoretically, he could have had this massive overarching plan. Spider-Man would have been clueless and just showed up at the last second to, you know, get beaten up a little bit. Well, I think that... Um... What's nice is that even though his motives kind of shift, it doesn't feel unnatural. I think when I'm watching the movie, it never occurred to me as a as a teenager when this movie came out. Mm-hmm. Oh, did we even mention that Peter Parker gets bitten by a spider and gets superpowers? Right, right. Yeah, because I don't think we did. Okay. <laughs> That's uh, a big important part of the story. It, it, it is. So <laughs> the way uh, Spider-Man and Peter Parker like happen is uh, he gets bitten by a spider at Oscorp. Yeah. And uh, in the movie, it's a, gen- a genetically engineered was it uh, spider. Yep, there was a big field trip. Yeah, it was a field trip. Yeah, but to Oscorp. Okay. Yeah. I thought it was just in a research lab. Oscorp. Which is... I know it was definitely Oscorp in The Amazing Spider-Man. Like, yeah. Like, 100%. Yeah. Everything and, goes to Oscorp there. And it was Oscorp in... Uh, movie. I'm okay. Very, very sure that it was. Well, whatever the case is, it was still a, a genetically engineered spider that, uh, that bites him. Bites him, and then, uh, and you know what? This is something that always drove me crazy about mm-hmm. the movie. It's that the spider goes away. Like it, it, it could go out and bites anybody, anybody else, mm-hmm. and and um, 
that's unsettling. Like it's just like there could be a lot of Spider Mans out there. Like I I would have preferred if it it died. Like if somebody just like stepped on it or or I yeah. don't know. I, I it just it just seemed very in uh, the comics uh, it. Uh, died. Yeah, it died because it well, it wasn't. It was radioactive. Like yeah. it was like, oh, I'm dying. I'm gonna bite this guy for some reason. Yeah. And then and then it died. And then and I was cool with that. In fact, there was a story in the comics, the Ezekiel story, right? No, uh, this is actually called the Thousand, oh. where there's a guy who was who, who used to pick on Peter Parker. Actually, witnessed the bite, mm -hmm. and he know he basically figured out that Peter Parker was Spider Man based on witnessing the bite and seeing Spider Man come out. Of, and he's like, okay, I want this power. But and so he had the radioactive spider, oh. but it was dead, so he couldn't get it to bite him. So he he did the next best thing and ate it. <laughs> and but that had a, a much more adverse reaction. Oh no! And so instead, it, uh, he became he literally became thousands of spiders and oh. would inhabit people's skin. Mm -hmm. uh, he would basically crawl inside, haul them out, and to take over their skin. And and uh, because because he's a villain, he blamed Peter Parker for. His, uh, affliction. Uh, his affliction and oh, wow. wanted to kill him. And and uh, <laughs> but they haven't done a movie on that one yet, unfortunately. <laughs> well, that uh, that would be kind of gross. <laughs> it would it would definitely uh, boost the rating to uh, to from like I don't know. Well, actually, at least PG. They're probably PG. Uh, they're either PG. Yeah. Or PG. So yeah. Uh, I I, de I think that one would definitely get a uh, PG thirteen slash fourteen A rating if they or at the very least, yeah. depending on how they handle the material. Okay, so uh, now we have uh, Spider-Man. Uh, he gets bitten. Mm -hmm. uh, he has a best friend uh, named Harry Osborn. Who is, who is Norman Osborn's uh, yeah. son. They both love Mary Jane because Mary Jane is... Pretty Kristen good. Dunst. Yeah, 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 pretty good looking. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I really had it bad for Kristen Dunst when I was a teenager. Like, oh. I was... Wow. My, uh, she was my like number one celebrity crush, and this movie started it. You would have been uh, the boys in the car. The boys in the car. Riding in uh, the movie that starred her. No, wait, that was Drew Barrymore. I'm sorry. Okay. That's why Oops. I'm 100% confused. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah. No, um, no. I was confused. I'm um, sorry. That's okay. I always get them mixed up, though. You get Drew Barrymore and Kristen Dunn mixed up. Stop. Yeah. I guess they both got kind of like chubby cheeks. I... Like cheeks you just want to kiss and pinch, and they're like, "Hey, you're adorable." <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so um, yeah, so yeah, uh, so yeah, uh, Harry Osborn, uh, friend Peter Parker, uh, Norman Osborn, uh, Harry's father, uh, becomes a psychopath. Yep, starts killing all all these peeps, and then when all his peeps are dead, he starts. Gunning, well, he finds out that Spider-Man is Peter Parker, mm -hmm. and so he starts uh, targeting people in Peter's life. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, uh, we, that that basically summarizes the movie. I think I, I I think that we don't need to give away the ending. Although, uh, you know, if Spider-Man died, that people would be pretty shocked. Uh, <laughs> With you know the release of Spider-Man Two. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that did not happen. Yeah, no. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, what uh, what is this movie really about? You know, what's the what's the more universal story? Uh, it's the classic hero's journey, uh, which is everywhere in movies and comics and literature and television. Mm -hmm. uh, an incredibly flawed person realizes that they are a flawed person and then does everything they can to uh, fix themselves and. Uh, by consequence of that, those around them uh, fails at uh, every possible turn, but ultimately comes out successful. It's I, I feel it's almost like about uh, embracing destiny in a sense, as as like he, he's been thrust into this situation where he has to rise to the occasion, and he has, and and then he even gets given the option with, by the Green Goblin. Does he rise to become a hero, or does he rise to become a villain? If you called uh, Spider-Man a demigod, it could be classic uh, Greek mythology. Yeah, um, but uh, we'll leave that with Thor, <laughs> because yeah, we got we got we got god gods in the uh, in the Marvel mythos already. Yeah. Um, yeah. So 
And, and you know, I guess, spoiler alert, he does choose the path of the hero. But I think that that's sort of the, the, the balance of, like, what makes a hero, what makes a villain. Mm. Um, I guess, and in this case, and according to the movie, that what makes a villain is insanity. <laughs> um, which, you know, uh, if we can just uh, stop and say it for a second, uh, that isn't the case. Uh, mental disorder, uh, yes. psychopathy especially, and uh, like any real mental defect doesn't make somebody a bad person. Yeah, uh, you've been watching a lot of Dexter. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the morality of Dexter can be debated and argued uh, ad nauseum. Uh, however, uh, apparently uh, CEOs of most companies, especially in America, uh, profile as psychopaths? I, I, understand, I thought it was uh, sociopaths. Uh, uh, and a sociopath is kind of a colloquial term for psychopath. I thought psychopath was more like, I think I'm going to kill people today. Uh, and sociopath is sort of like, I just don't really empathize with these people's emotions. Uh, the thing that defines uh, sociopath and psychopath is uh, un, uh, feeling uh, incapable of emotion and uh, uh, that kind of stuff. It doesn't denote... Uh, you know, the desire to kill somebody uh, okay. denotes emotional state and, uh, like, the possibility of connecting to people. Okay. Uh, I mean, and that makes sense to thrive in a business world. you got to be cutthroat. I mean, you don't, well, no, I don't, actually, I don't believe you have to be cutthroat, mm -hmm. but I think that your chances of success are much greater if you have a sociopathic tendency to be cutthroat. Yeah, yeah. Because, um, I mean, ultimately... If you think of your employees as, as numbers, then like, okay, we can cut their hours. That's not a problem. Or if you think of them as people, you're like, well, they really could use an ability to pay rent. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I do believe like businesses can function perfectly well uh, under under good moral supervision. Starbucks is proving that time and again. Well, okay, no, I, I had a bad experience with Starbucks, but it wasn't the company's fault. Yeah. It, was, it was a management issue. In fact... With the way I was being treated at Starbucks, the one of my one of the assistant manager said that the company would not have been really happy with that because I was getting like eight hours a week. Yeah. And and he says like you're getting all these benefits of like get the the free coffee and all these, and if someone from like a little higher up would see this, they'd be like, why are we why are we keeping this person on the payroll if you're not giving them enough hours to justify us giving him these extra benefits anyway. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. Uh, Starbucks, it does have a reputation for treating employees well. In conclusion, I think how that leads back to the movie is that uh, it doesn't necessarily mean you're evil or the Green Goblin. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Do we want to talk about the costumes? The costumes? Um, so, okay, yeah, we, can, we can dive a little bit into some of the, some of the like, I mean, this is something that because Spider-Man, he's always been my favorite superhero. I've loved Spider-Man since I was I used to pretend I was Spider-Man. I, I would too. All the time. Yeah. Like, I was, I had a whole, like, universe in my head of, uh, of games. Um, Me too. So, so, some of the things, there were, there were choices made in this film, aesthetically, and, um, and also, like, his powers and stuff like that, that, that I can nitpick. Let, let's nitpick. Uh, so, fine. yeah, I, I'm not normally very nitpicky, but I, I so, think that... So, first off, uh, okay. the, the Green Goblin uh, looks like uh, Jason David Frank was getting ready for the Power Rangers, saw that costume, and said, no way. <laughs> no. You know, I, I the, the costume does get a lot of flack. I, I never had a problem with it, really. I don't, I, I don't love it. In fact, in fact I, but what, what made me sort of resent the helmet of the Green Goblin a little bit. He looks like he was rejected by the Power Rangers. Yeah, well, okay, he does look a little Power Ranger. I'm not gonna lie. I didn't I didn't really resent it until I saw some of the test footage of the of a Green Goblin mask that they're making. Oh. Uh, you should look it up online. Everyone should. It, it it's like a, a functioning mask that was that really resembled the one in the comics, and it could huh. move its mouth and eyebrows. It was very expressive, wow. and it was cool and it was creepy and. I was like, and they got a functioning model of it. I'm like, why didn't they use that in the movie? It would have been so much better. Huh. Um, so I don't know why they fell back on this helmet. Because, uh, I mean, ultimately the helmet, it's not expressive. Yeah. And it's it's not, I mean, again, I don't think it's horrible. But it, uh, it is a little, one of the more campy factors in the movie. Yeah. I wish they went with the other thing. But I'm no, I don't hate this choice. I just, 
I'm, but uh, I shouldn't be indifferent toward it. I should, yeah. I should have thought that it was really cool. Uh, well, I just, uh, no. no, no, you know, you're not a fan at all. No, no, uh, yeah, it's nice though that how uh, William Defoe using uh, the mask uh, and not taking it off uh, through like ninety five percent of his time as the Green Goblin uh, shows that he's not like a egocentric actor who wants more face time. Yeah. Uh, I now that's another thing about the Green Goblin is that, and this is something I didn't know for a long time. A lot of people hate William Defoe's performance. Oh no! And I didn't, I didn't know that. Like this was news to me. But then apparently, like I read some articles that that said it as if it was common knowledge. Like, and everyone hates William Defoe's performance. Oh. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, how do you not? I always liked it, and I still do. Actually, even watching it again, I, I think William Defoe's performance is William. Like, it's not William. Oh, William. It's William. Willem. Like Willem Scream? No. I'll, let me show you. I'm gonna IMDb this right now. I'll show you. Uh, not Wilhelm. But uh, it's Willem. It's it's, yeah. not, it's not spelled like William. But Willem. I, I, See Willem Willem Defoe. Uh, w I L L E M. Okay, and now I know. Yeah, that's, uh, so there you go. But then again, sometimes mispronouncing things is my thing. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah. That's, and that's okay. Yeah. Because uh, sometimes I don't know how to spell things, and then like that, I'm like, oh, why haven't I written this before? <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Uh, if for me, William Defoe's uh, performance is the one thing that kind of hides uh, expertly uh, the campiness of the entire movie. Well, uh, you see, I almost felt like it embraced it and like and uh, and capitalized on it and made it a strength rather than a weakness. Well, uh, for me, it was always like because he was going so over the top, everyone else kind of was dragged along to <laughs> the same level. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I guess uh, it just felt like he had a lot of fun with it. It was very theatrical. It was. Uh, and he, he kind of golemed before Gollum did, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, ah. He, he, he played with voices. And so I... I, I I, so it's I don't understand why people don't like it still. I think I mean maybe it is because it was campy and maybe people expected more from Willem Dafoe. Yeah, but, but like it has to be. I mean, imagine seeing the script the way that we just saw it. Yeah. Uh, and like, what what can you do? I, I mean, like I, I'm surprised nobody uh, said anything like, "Gee, Willikers, Spider-Man." Gee, gee whiz! <laughs> Holy cow! There's a bomb heading toward New York. Somebody's got to save us. And I do feel that uh, he totally outshines Tobey Maguire and Kirsten Dunst. As much as I like Kirsten Dunst, I don't feel like her performance was strong. Uh, I feel like it was... I mean, again, you can work with the material you have. Yeah. And and, uh, and she was... Uh, she was an okay damsel in distress. I think both um, her and Tobey Maguire did a lot better in the next movie. Well, for me, Kirsten Dunst really just peaked at E.T. So you, you pronounced it wrong. You said Kristen, right? Oh. I think that... it's Kirsten. Oh. It's... Yeah, see, oh, look. <laughs> that's two for two. Okay. Well, next you're going to say, like, Tobias McGuire or something like that. You mean it's not? <laughs> I mean, uh... I, I mean, I guess... Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, Kirsten Dunst. Kirsten, yes. Okay. K-I-R-S-T-E-N. Kirsten Dunst. Yeah. Uh, for me, she really peaked at E.T., <laughs> That's true, Barry. Oh. <laughs> oh god! Oh god! I'm was that was, it. was that like legit, <laughs> or were you like just goofing around? Because it could. I just. I literally don't know if, if you're. I, I I'm going to go with joking around. Oh no, he was he was serious. <laughs> no, no, he wasn't. Uh, okay. Really, he wasn't. Okay. <laughs> um. Yeah, you're looking forward to Kirsten Dunst the new Adam Sandler movie. Oh. <laughs> uh, that is Drew uh, Barrymore. LOL, JKs. Hashtag kidding, hashtag not kidding. You know, Tubby McGuire, that's also, I don't know, he always seemed like a strange choice for Peter Parker. And, I mean, I, actually, I kind of like him more now, seeing him up today. I think maybe I just didn't, I didn't get it as a teen, but I, I think well, it's still not my ideal choice. I, I think... Part of the reason why they may have gone at Tobey Maguire is they wanted uh, somebody who looked 18, who was a big name, 
or kind of a big name. And well, I mean, I thought this movie made him a big name. Well, it made him a much bigger name, but, you know, he was, uh, like, making the rounds, doing, like, Cider House Rules and uh, movies like that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he was coming up, and they just wanted somebody, maybe, who looked like they could play 18. Yeah. Uh, which, uh, you know, is uh, kind of surprising because uh, Andrew Garfield and... Um, what, what's her name? Emma Stone? Emma Stone. Uh, were both, like, in their 30s when they played... No, no, they weren't in the 30s. Uh, yes, I, they were. No, 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 no. Now, Andrew Garfield is probably... 29, 30 now, but when he was shooting I mean, Spider-Man, he was, I mean, he was still too old to be in regular. Uh, but he was in his 20s. Um, um, I'm, I assure you, he was. Um, I mean, Emma Stone is, I think Emma Stone's younger than my, than I am still, so, I mean, oh, well. she, she hasn't, she hasn't suddenly gotten older than me. But, but again, they, they're still not, they still weren't teenagers. They were still well in their 20s. <laughs> But I think Andrew Garfield, like, really pulls it off. Like, he looks young well, for how uh, old he is. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, we're, but, you know, casting actors around the same age to play that age uh, extends ex uh, our uh, suspension of disbelief, I think. But, yeah, let's not get on to an Amazing Spider-Man too much, because that's, that's a podcast for another day. Yes. So, um, but one of the casting choices I like the most in, in this Spider-Man is... Uh, James Franco versus Willem Dafoe as like a father son duo. They they like visually, it's I totally buy it. Mm -hmm. Like I think it it was a really good aesthetic choice, uh, and I think James Franco did fine as sort of like as the brooding um, Harry Osborn. Well, yeah, he's uh, you know a really decent meth actor. He has well, uh, he also played James Dean too. I can't believe it. Uh, yeah, you know, actually, yeah, I could, I could totally see him playing James Dean. I know a lot of people really like James Franco, um, but for quite a while I took issue with him, and then I started to warm up to him because he started to take on some really good roles, and started to take issue with him again. Oh. <laughs> I, I just feel like, I don't know, there's, uh, I mean, first it seemed like he was always doing the same thing, but then he started to do some radical switches. Uh, I like, he did, like, milk and, and, uh... He, he kind of seems, uh... To me, like the uh, kind of guy who gets the script from his age and he's like, yeah, I'll do this. Shows up on the set, like, all uh, cool and relaxed, and then just, like, bangs out an awesome performance. And then it's like, okay, I'm good to my trailer, guys. Scene five. And then he goes and gets high. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, maybe that's part of where I'm, I'm a little iffy on him right now, is I kind of feel like, he, although he's making it in Hollywood, he doesn't seem, like, professional. He just kind of seems like he's coasting on it. And, like... Like, miraculously, because I didn't, don't know if you can actually coast. Well, and, uh, uh, James Franco happens to be an insanely, insanely talented genius. Like, certified Is he genius. certified genius? I think he's an insane genius, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but he, could, you know, he could be legitimately... Well, not only is he an amazing actor, but he is uh, quite a talented painter. And uh, he... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. When you talk about him being a painter, I mean, I don't know if you know about some of the things he's been painting recently, but uh, it may or may not be Seth Rogen in various naked poses. <laughs> so, <laughs> that is absolutely hilarious. It, it's hilarious, but what, I haven't seen anything like other than that. <laughs> so it's like, well, whatever floats your boat, Mason. I, uh... Well, oh, well <laughs> I've heard a lot of buzz about him being a painter, so okay. uh, there's that. Uh, also... Uh, while continuing to uh, paint and, uh, you know, do amazing things in acting, uh, he went to, I think it was Harvard, or where was it? It was a really prestigious uh, East Coast school, and, like, graduated. Okay. I, mean, I, I, I believe, I believe that he's an intelligent person. Uh, I guess, I just, I... I... I don't know. I don't. I don't want to say anything bad about James Franco. I mean, he'll probably like anything I say. He'd probably do a parody with Seth Rogen uh, <laughs> online, and every um, millions of people will watch. Actually, that'd bring a lot of traffic to our site. Actually, yeah, it, uh, it would. <laughs> so, uh, do we want to say uh, screw James Franco? Nah, nah. No. You know, the thing is, is that like whatever the case is, uh, as long as him and Seth Rogen keep doing like strange eccentric things together, uh, the world is a slightly better place. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you ever watched that Kanye West parody video. Um, the uh, the original is almost unwatchable. Oh. 
but the but the but the parody that him and James Franco did basically sorry no him and, and Seth Rogen because he's uh, see his James yes Franco. Uh, James Franco played Kanye West <laughs> Seth Rogen played Kim Kardashian and they did a Shop Kika remake uh, <laughs> Bound Two I think was the original song anyway it's uh I, I might have seen that I can't remember uh, yeah uh it's, it's not a good song actually it's a really awful song. <laughs> Uh, actually, it's one of the worst songs I've ever heard in my life, but, you know, I, I, I have a controversial opinion about Kanye West. Too. Well, the only opinion of Kanye West that uh, matters to Kanye West is Kanye West's. Uh, no, everyone's opinion matters to Kanye West. He wants everyone to love him. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, I'm Kanye West, and if you don't love me, I'm going to kill myself <laughs> on stage for the world to see. I'll be a martyr for, uh, for, for myself. <laughs> Okay, sorry. sorry. So, uh, tangent, tangent, tangent. <laughs> Spider-Man 1. Uh, yeah, so the, uh, Spider-Man's costume uh, happens to actually be uh, one piece. And from what I hear, he, uh, Tobey Maguire had to be uh, sewed into it and wow. sewed out of it to pee. Well, um, that's, uh, that's a lot of work. He's like, hey, you want some water, Tobey? He's like, no. No, I don't. I mean, I do, but I really don't. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there was like different uh, Spider-Man uh, costumes uh, for different kinds of uh, scenes and shots. Like there was one where you could take the mask off, and then there was one for like walking around. And... Yeah, and um, but aesthetically, how do you like it? Because um, I, I I've never I've never loved it. Actually, the only the only costume in the movies that I've liked a lot. Is the most recent Amazing Spider-Man, Amazing Spider-Man Two, yeah, where they they finally nailed it, like they really did a good job on the costume. Yeah, the thing that I for like all the superhero costumes except uh, Kick-Ass, uh, I, I think they kind of missed the mark on it because part of what makes Spider-Man Spider-Man is he's this like uh, middle class kid uh, who's you know falls ass backwards. Uh, into uh, his circumstance, and then to protect his identity, because he wants to protect his identity, he needs to uh, manufacture his own costume. And we don't really get to see that process. We see, like, um, a sort of a step in that direction with his fight with Bonesaw. Yeah, but... But, uh, but it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of a jump from that to the to the costume as it is. But, but even still, we don't see, like, the procurement of materials and, like, the sewing. Well, I mean, there's only so much of that you want to see. Well, yeah, but, like, we don't see any of it. Like, we in Kick-Ass, uh, we get to see, uh, like, him ordering it online and then it coming... And then, like, you know, actually, you know, the, the best movie for that is Mystery Men. Oh, yeah. Where they they literally, there's a whole sewing class where they're, like, putting together their costumes. And, and you know, that was a good scene. And yeah, they, I, that, there's another movie where it turns out a lot of people didn't like it, but I love Mystery Men. I think it's a great superhero parody. Uh, it, it is, but I think that what most people don't get about Mystery Men is that it's a parody. Oh, <laughs> well, well they, uh, they guess they... They need to learn a little bit more. Well, like, oh, wow, they walk, well, they walk into a movie with a bunch of superheroes, and it's funny. And it pokes fun. Of, what are they going to think? Like, It's a funny superhero movie. But it, it was supposed to turn the genre kind of on its head. And it's actually uh, a very bad adaptation of an uh, actual comic book. It's true, property. yeah. Now, apparently... Flaming Carrot. I don't know much about the Mystery Men comic book line. Oh, um... um uh, they I, are kind of secondary characters uh, in a comic uh, book whose main character is the Flaming Carrot. Uh, so the Flaming oh. Carrot isn't flamboyantly gay. Uh, he is a person whose head is a gigantic carrot. And instead of hair or like the green stalk or whatever, yeah. it it's fire on top. Okay. Well, uh, now I've learned something. Um... <laughs> Back to the movie. Uh, as we, 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 this, I think we're going to tangent a lot. I think that's sort of how it goes. Yeah, I, I don't know. Anything else you want to specifically talk about, or should we move on to just like what do you what do you like? What makes this movie good for you? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I am a huge huge sucker for the superhero genre. 
I like. It's a good time to live when you're a sucker for the superhero genre because there are tons of superhero movies coming oh, out. So many. But this was one of the first that, that made it like a viable mainstream option. Uh, I I would say that uh, it's not the first. No. The um I'd say Blade started this this revolution. I, Blade shouldn't have happened. <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, I, I, you know, I, 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 for a vampire kind of genre film, the first Blade was pretty decent. Uh, the but, but I don't Blade remember. Trinity? I, I don't think I like. I didn't watch Blade Trinity because I didn't even really like the second one that much. Yeah. Um, but when, but the one that really set things in motion was X Men. Yes. And then when when X Men was a big hit and Spider Man was like a record breaking hit, like it had the best opening weekend of any movie. Mm-hmm. Like, I think it beat Jurassic Park. I think that's the one that it beat. That that some, suddenly everyone, all all the executives in Hollywood, all their heads turn and they're like, okay, this is happening. Mm-hmm. We are going to make comic book movies a thing. And now it's 2014. What is it? Uh, 12 years later. Is that is that 2002 or is it 2001? Um. My, my instincts tell me 2002. Well, actually, you know what? I got IMDb right here on standby. Yeah. 2002. So, yeah. 12 years ago. 12 years ago. Good God. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, now, it's 2014. You got superhero movies coming out your wazoo. Uh, apparently, uh, at, like, Disney's film studios, yeah. uh, there is a room where there exists a timeline of Marvel comic book property movies yeah. from, like, this year all the way through to 2028. Wow. So this is... I don't think that this is a genre that's going away anytime soon. No, no. Uh, especially if, if it continues to, like, perform as it does. Like, superhero movies... If you look at the list of the top... 100. Top, even 50 yeah. highest grossing movies of all time... There's, you're gonna see a lot of superhero films in that list, and is Spider-Man one, I think, is is among that list. But I mean, and, but that was it was a pioneer as far as like the field of superhero movies goes. And you know, X-Men two years before. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, X-Men again. X-Men was was the pathway. Like it was the it was the it was the one that kicked open the gate. Spider-Man just swung through it. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so yeah, what what made but, you like the movies? Uh, well, I you know. Really, just love the you know superhero story. Uh, I like seeing the struggle. And Spider Man was a character I always connected with on a more personal level because uh, I identified a lot with Peter Parker. And then yeah. you know, other than that, he had super cool powers, right? Mm-hmm. And you know, the popularity of that character in the comics is. is what? evident of that like in uh, marvel team-up stories uh it's usually uh, spider-man and yeah <laughs> yeah and i you know it was it was kind of nice watching it again uh because i used to watch this movie a lot when i was a kid mm-hmm. uh i'm a kid as in like a teenager uh and so there was a lot of things that i i kind of i mean i used to know the movie beat for beat for beat but now uh, it's been so long I, I probably haven't watched it in i mean at least five years Probably more than that. Yeah. So kind of rediscovering it was kind of nice. And it, it's it's kind of interesting to see, like, how the actors have progressed since then, how the characters have, how they changed kind of through the years. But I think, like, what I like is that they, that they, despite the campiness, there is a real heart to the story, you know? Yeah. Like, it does, it does, I was watching, like, Uncle Ben's death and stuff like that. It, it, it did affect me still. You know, even though I, I yeah. again, I, I used to watch it a lot. I know exactly what was going to happen. It's, uh, Sam Raimi does a good job of balancing kind of a goofiness with some legitimately heartfelt storytelling. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it, it was really, really good. And, uh, oh, yeah, uh, spoiler alert, uh, Peter Parker's Uncle Ben dies. <laughs> Now, if that's a spoiler to anyone, they've never even heard of Spider-Man, because uh, <laughs> it's the, the it's the turning point. Is what turns him from a, that's like the moment where he becomes a man. Well, you know, yeah. yeah. But uh, then again, you know, Spider-Man's whole thing is kind of uh, self-inflicted victimhood, too. Self-inflicted victimhood. Well, yeah, because if you think about it, uh, him wanting to use his powers in the first place. Uh, for his own benefit is a very reasonable decision. Uh, it's yeah. what everybody does. You know, you go to college, uh, you get uh, 
bachelor's degree in uh, psychology, psychoanalyzing uh, employees of a corporation will pay your bills. It might not be the best use of your abilities, right. uh, like morally speaking, but it is a legitimately good and you know not immoral decision to make for right. yourself. Uh, Spider-Man wanting to make money with his powers, that's an okay thing to decide to do. I think that that's a, that is something that's very true to humanity, in that like a lot of decisions we make are selfish. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're making really immoral decisions. It's just sort mm-hmm. of it's almost a natural thing to just to be so you know to make choices that are in your own benefit. Yeah, uh, but then you know uh, Uncle Ben, who moments before had told him that you know if you have great power, you have great responsibility to use it yeah. uh, to help people. Uh, after he dies, he feels incredibly responsible for not doing something he could have done, which you know. The decision not to do it perfectly okay, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and everything that happens to Spider-Man uh, is a result of this uh, self-inflicted victimhood because he makes himself feel responsible. You know, like uh, his, in uh, the Ultimate uh, Spider-Man comic books, uh, his blood kind of gets uh, stolen and then used to create monsters, and he, because it's his blood. He feels right. really responsible for the creation of these things when all that he's really at fault for is uh, losing his blood. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a good point. It's a sort of a you know, and that's the thing about Spider-Man. He is a, he's always been a bit of a sulky character. I mean, he he is very much like oh, the world. I'll, I'll never be Spider-Man again. The world hates me, and I just do not <coughs> get the people I love hurt. Oh, woe is me. But then something always goes like, switches the, you know, it flicks the switch back. He's like, but I can't stop being Spider Man because I have a responsibility. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, they say they say that line a lot. The power responsibility line a lot. Yeah. And, uh, it, it, it's there's so much that for decades now it's kind of a cliche in yeah. every single movie. And you know, in the original comic book, the Amazing Fantasy number. 15? 15. Yeah. Uncle Ben didn't even say that line. Oh. It was like the narrator, like, the, you know, the little block of text yeah. above the panel. It was like in the final panel. It's like, and this, and then Peter Parker learned that with great power comes great responsibility. Huh. Somehow it became Uncle Ben's thing to pass on to Peter hmm. through time. So, wow. uh, what, what did you not like about the movie? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> uh oh. You're just bringing out the boxing gloves. I'm I'm going to dub this uh, the writer's money shot. Okay. Because that's really what it is. Uh, It's when, uh, like, a line of dialogue or moment of action happens where, like, you see it and it's like, you can see the writer chuckling to himself. Like, yeah, I am so clever. Okay. And this movie had those moments in spades. (laughs) Yeah. Um, there, there's you're like, not Superman, you know. <laughs> oh, but I'm a, but I'm Spider-Man. Ah, I get it. <laughs> yeah. Superman's in a different universe. And, and uh, you know, there's uh, all, all sorts of different uh, things like that in, in this, where the, the writer is just chuckling to himself, like, oh my god. Yeah, you see what I did here? I just did, yeah, that, that happened. And I did it. High five. <laughs> High five. Don't leave me hanging. High five. Simon's like, I'm just gonna shoot your shoot your script. Yeah, okay, I'm not gonna give you a high five, but <laughs> but I'll shoot your script. Um, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. like it's just like it seems to take so much pleasure from itself. It's kind of like walking in on a teenager when they think they're alone. Ah, well, let's not kid ourselves and think that only teenagers do things alone. Um. <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> now, um, moving right along. Uh, yeah, b- but yeah, I think it's like you're not Superman, you know. But yeah, dramatic irony. He's uh, Spider-Man, you know. He's still a superhero. And uh, oh, what were some other things like? Uh, yeah, we don't need a lot of specific examples because uh, because we gotta oh, yeah. get the show on the road. Right. Yeah. Um, 
I kind of um, my my disputes with the film are a little more. Uh, my disputes are mo- mostly nitpicky. I think. I think that um, like they hammed up like his confrontation with Flash Gordon. No, <laughs> Flash Thompson, not Flash Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, I'm not the only one now. Bam. Uh, well, I mean, uh, they hammed it up a little too much. Like, surely somebody would have noticed that like he's Peter Parker did these ridiculous superhuman flips and, and you know yeah. it just it just seemed like there's a i think i wanted more believability in the re- revealing of his powers like there's some very funny stuff that happened mm. like with him going go web and everything like that <laughs> uh like i like i like little touches like that because it show it does show kind of a realism is like he doesn't know how to use these mm-hmm. these powers yet this is all very new to him but when it got it just got a little silly at points yeah. and i wasn't a big fan of that also i'm not a big fan of the organic web shooters yeah. i i can't understand the the, the like the biology of it it doesn't make any sense to me like does he have yeah. web pouches in his biceps or something you know it's just yeah i i can't figure it out uh and i and i think that i always really liked the web shooters because it was sort of another way that it showed that peter parker was kind of brilliant yeah and it was a, he uses ingenuity to create something that no one had ever created before that yeah. really serves his his powers well another thing i didn't like is uh, the New Yorkers banding together cliche, which is in nearly every like action kind of movie <laughs> uh, set in New York. Well, I don't, I don't mind the, what, it, why it happened, when it happened, and that it happened, but how it happened, it was just a little too much. We're sort of like, you mess with one of us, you mess with all of us. It's just like, really, guys? Like, are we really going that far with it? It was just like. They could have taken it back a few notches, and I would have been 100% okay with that. Uh, it's just such a cliche that I, <clears throat> I'm not even on board. Okay, um, well, fair enough. But, but we can at least agree they hammed it too much. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, but they hammed quite a lot. Bechdel test? That... Yeah, yeah, you're, you're your little baby, the Bechdel test. Yeah, the, the Bechdel test. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. Okay, it, uh, so there are uh, many women who have names. Yes. Uh, who except one, except Betty Brandt has a name and they never say it. Yeah. yeah and uh, I feel yeah. that she she could. I would like a little more Betty Brandt. Yeah. Yeah. But you know we won't get that. Elizabeth until. Banks before she was famous too. Huh. Yeah. There's women who have names uh, that are integral to the plot. Uh, they do not talk to each other at all, uh, so they can't even have a conversation about a man, let alone something other than a man, uh, the, the test, the, the movie <laughs> fails categorically. Uh, there's no exceptions. There's no redeem, redeeming factor for the Bechdel test uh, in this movie. Yeah, I, this is, I, I think that female characters aren't super strong in this. I, I think, again, like Mary Jane, uh, I think she gets stronger as the series progresses. Or at least in the second film. Yeah. Um, but in this one, she does kind of serve a purpose to be the love interest to, a, like, a lot of characters. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. She, she kind of exists for the benefit of the men around her. And that's yeah. And, and really for people. Good. And for Spider-Man to save. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that... But I think Aunt May is a pretty good character. Yeah, um, but and, even she is a damsel? Well, yeah, a little bit. So... Yeah, I, I think that, um, but I, again, it's, it's also hard because it's it is adapting older source material. Yeah. Um, from from an age when when those sort of like cli- cliches about women's roles in in superhero literature when that was it was more common. Like yeah. it was the t- kind of that's what I, one of the things I do like about the new the newer Spider Man series is that they're trying hard to make. Gwen Stacy, a stronger, more, uh, sm- a more strong-willed character uh, with an identity of her own. And I think this would be a better conversation when we talk about the Amazing Spider-Man Two. Uh, yes, yes, but first, yeah, we got it. We got a few Spider-Man things to go there, through. There's still Spider-Man movies. Uh, it's true. Yeah, we got we got five Spider-Man movies, but we're going to just cover the first three. Um, so next time we will talk about we'll talk about Spider-Man Two. Final rating. What what what's out of five stars? One being rubbish, five being amazing. What do you give Spider-Man? Uh, three and a half. Okay, I'm gonna give it. I think I'm gonna give it a four. Yeah, I. I it seems like <laughs> I have. I have a soft spot for it. I can't lie. Yeah, I do. and 
it, it's something, it is a movie that I do enjoy a lot. Like, it's why I bought the movie. I have fond memories of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it but, like, it is unforgivably campy at <laughs> uh, times. I, I, I'd say, but it's also at other times forgivably campy. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that, I don't know if this movie could have been made this way nowadays because uh, the expectation for superhero films has has changed. I think one of the main turning points was 2008 when it was back to back Iron Man and then Dark Knight. I think that that's when there was a real big turning point in the expectation for comic book films. Yeah, uh, well, like Christopher Nolan really changed things with his dark, gritty reboot. Yeah. Uh, he set a new stage for what these movies were supposed to be. Or, well, I mean, or even what they could be. Like, people I don't think understood that, like, like the potential of the films. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, again, another another conversation for another day. So, I feel that way, all right? Yeah. Um, so, Spider-Man, have you seen it? Uh, feel free to leave some comments, uh, some opinions. Do you think we're barking mad for really... For, for being on board with Willem Dafoe? Or do you think that, you know, like, we didn't give Tobey Maguire enough justice? Um, just be just be honest with us. Uh, we'd love to hear some feedback, and uh, we will read any comments on the show when, once we get this up on the air. So don't expect it for a few episodes. But um, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting this off the ground. It, yeah, it's going to be epic. Uh, all right, thanks for listening. This is Doug signing off. And Mason. Have a good movie watching.